hello everyone. Um, welcome to our first uh, happy hour time period um, update on the Northern Chaco Outliers Project. Um, I'm Carrie Schler and I'm the laboratory manager at Crow Canyon. And I'm Kellum Throgmorton. I'm the supervisory archaeologist. And we're really excited to get to share uh, some of our updates on what we've what we've done with the Northern Chaco Outliers Project in the last number of years. Um, and as many of you know, the mission of Crow Canyon is to empower present and future generations by making the human past accessible and relevant through archaeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. And Crow Canyon staff are actively working on this mission, even while we're all trapped at home, um, <laughs> like I am right now, and Kellum is as well, separately, right, in our separate homes, I'm by developing new <laughs> distance learning opportunities uh, like, like this webinar, things like this webinar. And you can support us in developing new and fun online educational programming by going to our website, crocanyon.org, and clicking on, support, clicking on the Support Crow Canyon button. We'll also have links to some of our already developed online content and ways you can support Crow Canyon at the end of the presentation. So we thank you for your support and we hope that you enjoy today's webinar. I'm gonna do a few little logistical things before we get started here. Kellum and I are really excited to share our most recent findings from the Northern Chaco Outliers Project with you all today. We're gonna tag team the presentation a little bit and hope that makes it more fun for us to do it and also for all of you to watch it. And hopefully that'll make it a little more casual as well. So we want this to be interactive, so please submit questions. If you're watching on Zoom, you should see a button that says Q&A on your screen where you can type in questions. Um, and if you're watching on Facebook Live, which I think Dylan's working on getting set up, you can type in questions in the comments box. We have a lovely moderator, our Sarah Payne, who will be asking your questions of Callum and I at the end of the presentation. And I hear that Dylan tells me that over 400 people have signed up for the webinar. So, so Callum, we have no pressure at all. This, you know, no, easy peasy. <laughs> so we'll try to get to all of your questions, but if we, if there are like 400 of them, we probably won't get to them all. So if that's the case, um, and we don't get to your question today, then please email us or make a comment on Facebook to Crow Canyon, and we'll be sure to get that question answered for you. All right, so now I'm gonna turn things over to Kellum for him to introduce the project. We're gonna be going back and forth, telling you about the field component from Kellum's perspective and a little bit of the lab component from my perspective. Um, and so go ahead and take it away, Kellum. All right, thanks, Carrie. Um, so Crow Canyon's Northern Chaco Outliers Project focuses on ancestral Pueblo communities east of Cortez uh, in southwestern Colorado. So archaeologists refer to this area as the Lakeview community. So I'm coming to you live from, well, actually my living room floor, and that's only about 10 minutes away from where the Lakeview community is, just uh, east of town here. So the project, it, it's occurring on lands that are ancestral to the Pueblo tribes of New Mexico and Arizona, and it's within the Aboriginal territory of the Diné people, as well as the Ute Mountain and Southern Ute tribes. So I'm going to preface uh, my project overview by noting that this talk is pretty archaeological in nature. Uh, you know, it's, by that I mean that it presents a version of events, issues, research questions that reflects predominantly Western ways of knowing. There are other equally valid ways of approaching ancestral places in the U.S. Southwest uh, based on traditional frames of knowledge and discourse. Um, and what I'm giving you here is one way of looking at things uh, and perhaps even a very, you know, fairly narrow slice of, of, of how to approach it. So the Northern Chaco Outlier Project is investigating how 11th and early 12th century communities in what is now southwestern Colorado relate to the major cultural and political center at Chaco Canyon, which is about 100 miles away to the south in New Mexico. We're using a combination of archival research, excavation, laboratory analysis, and remote sensing to get a better handle on the relationships between these two areas. Uh, the photo here on your screen uh, gives you a, a better sense of the place. Uh, this is a drone shot overlooking the two great houses on the Haney site, as well as the iconic Ute Mountain in the distance, uh, Mesa Verde over kind of on the, uh, I guess that'd be the upper left. And if you've got good enough screen resolution, uh, you should be able to see the Carrizo Mountains in Arizona back there in the distance. Now I'm going to give you some background information on the Chacoan world. 
normally I'd ask for a show of hands for how many people have been to Chaco, how many people have been to Mesa Verde. Um, go ahead and raise your hands, but unfortunately I can't see you. So I'm going to take it on, uh, take it on faith that you have some knowledge, but that not everybody's been there. Um, anyway, Chaco Canyon, it's located in Northwestern New Mexico. At its height about a thousand years ago, Chaco Canyon was a major cultural and political center. Ancestral Pueblo communities across a huge swath of the Northern Southwest show evidence of Chaco and influence. The area encompassed by the Chaco and regional system was about 25,000 square miles. Uh, for comparison's sake, that's about the, the size of New England or the state of uh, Indiana. Now, I didn't intend for this slide to look like some dark cloud emanating from Mordor. Uh, that's not the message I'm trying to convey. Uh, I was just trying to show sort of this is where you're going to find outlier communities, that is, uh, communities outside of Chaco Canyon um, that are affiliated with it. Each of these communities, there are maybe 200 of them, each of these communities might have had a couple hundred residents uh, located throughout the area. However, this cultural system didn't appear overnight. Um, Reevaluation of the archaeology of one of the largest and earliest excavated buildings in Chaco Canyon has revised our chronology for the history of Chaco. There were clearly important leaders who had significant power within their community by the mid to late 9th century, uh, but Chaco Canyon was not the only place in the Southwest where big political events were happening and social inequalities were developing. But it was certainly one of the most impressive. By the early 900s, there were several massive masonry buildings that archaeologists called great houses within Chaco Canyon, uh, as well as a few communities nearby. And so this photo is showing you some of the oldest parts of, uh, of Pueblo Benito, one of the, the, the best preserved buildings in Chaco Canyon. At that time, most of the Chaco and influence was confined to the core area just around Chaco Canyon. But by the early 11th century, actual Chaco style great houses had spread across the southern reaches of what would become the Chacoan system. Uh, this area is known as the San Juan Basin. It, it basically is an area that stretches from south of Grants, New Mexico, over to Zuni, along the I-40 corridor through parts of Arizona and New Mexico. Uh, and then north of Gallup along what's now Highway 491. There's, uh, there's Chacoan sites uh, from the, the, the 10th and early 11th century all across there. Numerous communities that I'm going to call Great House communities, um, because they were focused around a large masonry building called a Great House, um, numerous communities began to resemble the cultural and political patterns of Chaco Canyon uh, during this time. Some of these communities had deep roots. There'd been people living there for uh, 100, 200 years. Uh, others were more recently established and seemed to have been like Chacoans actually moving into new places. So uh, what is this Chacoan pattern that I've been talking about? Um, there's a package of things that archaeologists use uh, and recognize as being distinctly Chacoan. So architecture is one of the big things we use to, to discuss thing, you know, what is a Chacoan community. Masonry construction, big core veneer walls where you've got nice stones on the outside and a rubble fill on the inside, uh, huge rooms, multiple stories, and blocked in circular kibas. So it's both the construction techniques and the floor plans is how we recognize these structures. And these buildings still stand out. You, know, you can go to Chaco Canyon and see them. They're still three, four stories tall. Uh, this is a real testament to the skills of the ancestral Pueblo Masons who built these things. Uh, we also define uh, the Chaco in packages, including landscapes. Uh, people uh, built and designed specific kinds of landscapes to surround these communities and they interacted with the surrounding world uh, in interesting ways. So I've got a photo down on the lower left uh, showing a road segment that's pointing at uh, the top of a peak that's about, well, I want to say it's 10 miles away. And on top of that peak, there is a shrine. And so these are ways that uh, they're, they're tying the broader world into the core of their community through modifying the landscape. And we recognize that as being a, a particularly Chacoan way of doing things. Settlement patterns are also important for defining uh, the, the Chacoan package. Typically, we'll find a community, uh, we'll have a great house or maybe two or three great houses uh, in rare cases, surrounded by dozens of smaller houses uh, that seem to have been the, the habitations of everyday non-elite people. The Chacoan package also includes material culture. Um, we, we, we can see this a lot when we think about it in terms of trade. Uh, when we look at the archaeology of Chaco Canyon, we see that turquoise from all over the southwest, you know, from sources all the way over into Nevada, are circulating and making their way to the center into Chaco Canyon. Um, shell, jet, uh, trees from distant mountain ranges, 
and obsidian and chert from distant lithic sources. These are all being traded around and making their way back to the center. It seems as if Chacoans were really invested in creating connections to far-flung places by bringing those materials to Chaco Canyon. Um, long distance trade also included copper that was sourced from uh, West Mexico in the form of bells and brought up. Uh, macaw feathers and actual macaws were being brought in from uh, sources in Mexico. And cacao beans were actually being brought up from Mexico as well. Finally, the way these objects were used highlights a suite of practices that we can define as uniquely Chacoan. Uh, construction tends to highlight order, balance, attention to detail, symmetry. Um, the photos on this slide relate to Chacoan ritual practices that can be surmised from the context and the form of the objects. Uh, so for example, the cylinder vessels that you see on your screen, those are modeled on examples that we know of from Mesoamerica. So it's like Chacoan elites were saying, this is how folks down in Mexico, the important people, um, are serving particular kinds of beverages like cacao and chocolate. They're using these cylinder vessels. We're going to make cylinder vessels in our own unique idiom, but use the same vessel form. So these practices uh, that we see, uh, they, they reflect a, a particular package of sort of Chacoan behavior. So by the middle of the 11th century, Chaco style sites are all over the Southern San Juan Basin. Uh, in the late 11th and early 12th century, Chaco style sites appeared along the middle San Juan River. So that's by contemporary Bloomfield and Aztec, New Mexico. They also appeared throughout Southwest Colorado and Southeastern Utah. And at this point, the classic Chacoan pattern emerged, a great house surrounded by a neighborhood of smaller houses. Um, I think it is good to think of these as neighborhoods because you know, we, we think of them as discrete sites, but when you're out there and you're actually walking around in the landscape, you know, you can, you can, you can imagine being able to shout your way across the whole community in several cases. Some of these communities had multiple great houses. Um, most only had one, but the multiple great house pattern seems to be particularly evident in the Mesa Verde region. Um, it's also found at, the, in, at a few communities in the south, uh, south of Chaco Canyon. So by the early 1100s, there are Chaco style buildings and communities networked across the Northern Southwest. We call these Chacoan sites outliers, not in some Gladwellian sense, but uh, simply because they literally lie outside of Chaco Canyon. Uh, it's not really that original of a term. Uh, so we can see this pattern by tracing where the outliers are, but then we're left asking, well, what, what was Chaco? And that's a really broad question that's driven archaeological research in the northern southwest for, uh, since the, the 1970s and the 1980s. And this is a question that continues to be relevant today and one of the things that we're addressing. So was Chaco a territorial polity? Was it an archaic state? Um, now, these are words that are kind of code words used in archaeology, and they might not resonate that well with, you know, normal folks who don't spend their life walking around in the desert and digging in dirt and trying to avoid getting hantavirus and all that kind of stuff. Um, basically, what they mean is someone or some group was in charge and directing traffic, and the people's lives outside the core areas were likely being affected, perhaps purposefully affected, by the actions of folks at the centers of these networks. Um, that's one way of looking at what this pattern is. Another option is that Chaco was a prestige style uh, that local communities chose to participate in. So I, I'm going to use an analogy to help you think this one through. In the United States, the neoclassical movement of the late 18th and early 19th century was all about elites hearkening back to the styles of ancient Greece and Rome. We wanted to represent ourselves as being like those ancient republics, so we actually built buildings and cities that looked like those ancient republics. Our political elite modeled their styles and behaviors and practices on them. And then wealthy folks hired architects to make their homes emulate the halls of government. So you can imagine if you've been out east, uh, you've, you've seen the, you know, the, the big buildings with the tall colonnades, and that's like every capital in the United States has got a building like that. But you've also seen a bunch of mansions that are modeled on the same style. So Chaco and Outliers, I think we can think of them as being like the prominent folks in a community modeling themselves on elites at the center. So that's another way of looking at what the Chacoan pattern is. Finally, um, these are all Western anthropological ways of looking at what we call uh, quote unquote political complexity. It's entirely possible that there are other ways of looking at Chaco and, it's, uh, what it's, what, and that its organization was unlike anything, uh, any of the models that we're currently working with. And I'd say stay tuned. I'm actually gonna give another lecture about this in a couple of weeks. So how are archaeologists uh, addressing these questions? There's a variety of ways we go about this. 
Um, we've engaged in examinations of the core Chacoan areas versus the peripheral areas of the Chacoan world. And there are clear differences that can highlight the dynamic relationship between different parts of the Chacoan system. Um, it also emphasizes the regional differences in outliers. For example, the Mesa Verde region where the Lakeview group is, uh, where Pro Canyon's working, is clearly really different than areas to the south of Chaco Canyon, where I've conducted research in the past. Another way that archaeologists are tackling Chaco is looking at community histories. Chaco has a looted definition based on what it is uh, in static fashion. I found it's a lot easier to understand Chaco by looking at what it does within communities. So archaeologists are making detailed consideration of how communities developed over time. What was a community like before Chaco and style features arrived? What was it like when Chaco was there? What was it like after Chaco? Um, and, and they can reveal sociopolitical trajectories through time and reveal hints of the motivations of the Chacoan builders and community members that, 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 that lived there. Finally, archaeologists are, are investigating the social fabric of individual communities. How are relations between people structured within these communities? To a certain degree, we've acted like there's Chaco over here, and then there's 200 odd outliers that are all basically the same floating around out there. Um, that's kind of like saying, all right, we know that Washington DC exists and that there's 50 other cities that have a similar combination of civic architecture and government buildings. Um, but I think we all recognize that say Boston is culturally really different than Salt Lake City. And those differences are critical for painting a complete picture of the United States. In a similar fashion, we want to understand that about outlier communities too. The unique ways that ancestral Pueblo people addressed common problems related to agriculture, social stratification, ecological change, and how the expression of identity varied through the region. What was the glue that held individual communities together? When did that glue fail to hold? And how did people reorganize? These are some of the things that we want to know. Now, case studies uh, are often the best way to take a big, broad, abstract idea and make it relatable and understandable. And so that's why Crow Canyon is looking at the Lakeview community specifically in southwestern Colorado. And Carrie's going to tell you a little bit more about that. Thanks, Callum. Yeah, Crow Canyon has chosen to address these big picture research questions within the Lakeview community. And one of the reasons is the Lakeview community is one of the densest concentrations of great houses in this region of Colorado. Um, it includes three archaeological sites with four Chacoan style great houses. Two of these great houses are at the Haney site, where Crow Canyon is currently conducting excavations and analyses. Um, the Ida Jean site, which is just over 800 meters to the west of Haney, and then the Wallace Ruin, just over 300 meters to the south of Haney. So the Lakeview community is a great place to address a number of big picture research questions about life in the past. These include human environment relationships, how were people using the environment and how is the environment affecting their lives during the period of time that they were living in the community? What is social stratification like? Do we see evidence of, as Callum was talking about, elites and commoners or people that have greater access to elite goods? What about community centers and public architecture? What are the different elements that we see about how this community, the Lakeview community, grew and changed over time? And then finally, what's the identity of the residents of the Lakeview community? Are they connected closely to Chaco? Are they connected to each other? Or are they separate little individual, um, individual uh, um, houses basically. And so we'll be looking at these things and addressing these questions using both new excavation data and also lab work at the Haney site, but also comparing what the residents of the Haney site were doing with folks living at other sites in the community. And so the advantage of uh, the Lakeview community is that there's been a good amount of archaeological research over the years including excavations at the Ida Jean site, which was excavated in the 1970s to the 1990s, and collections from the Ida Jean site are housed at the Canyons of the Ancients Visitor Center and Museum in Dolores, Colorado. So we in the lab have um, gotten those artifacts and are looking at them, and we've actually finished the analysis of almost 15,000 pottery sherds from the Ida Jean site. So we'll be using that data to help us address these big picture research questions. And then Wallace Ruin, which is currently being excavated by Bruce and Cindy Bradley. 
We're collaborating with the Bradleys on additional artifact analysis through a History Colorado State Historical Fund grant. And we've started this collaborative work, although it's in the beginning stages, so I don't have that much to report on just yet. So you have to stay tuned for future uh, reports like this one. And then in addition to the work that we're doing on collections work at Ida Jean and Wallace, we're gonna be doing our new excavations at the Haney site and continuing analyses. And now Kellum's gonna talk to you about what we've done so far as far as excavation. Yeah, thanks, Carrie. So the Haney site's actually been a bit of a unique challenge. In the Southwest, we are often able to look at a site on the surface and kind of determine at least what, what kinds of things are there. You know, the room block is over here. This is where the surface structures were. We can anticipate a, a pit structure here, a midden over here. Um, that hasn't worked very well at the Haney site because there was, uh, there's been a lot of earth moving and non-professional excavation at the site since the 1930s up until about uh, the mid 90s. Uh, a lot of stuff was leveled, scraped, backfilled and covered up, meaning that we, we, it's, we really don't know what, we, what we're finding under the surface until we excavate. And it's been full of surprises um, because it, it's really unpredictable, which actually makes it really exciting. Um, so to date, Crow Canyon has focused on the western third of the site. Uh, a 1960s era sketch map suggested that there were additional buildings adjacent to or below the West Great House. Uh, and we wanted to also test and see how much of the West Great House was still intact. And so these, these excavations have actually been critical for understanding the history of this, the, the Haney site and thinking about Haney both before, during, and after uh, the Chacoan buildings were, were, were there. Um, as well as understanding the relationships between people within uh, the Lakeview group and the Lakeview community. So we've been really focusing on trying to separate out these pre-Chacoan levels, the Chacoan levels, and the post-Chacoan levels. And this map here gives you a sense of uh, where on the site we're working. The property is owned by the Archaeological Conservancy, and Crow Canyon's work so far, as I said, has been over on that western third. Now, um, I'm going to walk through a series of different excavation trenches and kind of describe what we're finding through all of these. Um, area C1 is on the northwest corner of the site. Uh, it's a north-south trench that's identified surface rooms and a subterranean pit structure to the south. So this defines a classic ancestral Pueblo room suite. Uh, the surface rooms were remodeled several times. In the upper photo, in the upper right photo, uh, shows a wall stub as it's beginning to appear beneath the floor of a room. Um, the alignment of the walls clearly changed over time. You can see a wall sort of at the upper right of that photo, um, and then you can see the wall stub sort of in the center highlighted there. Um, so clearly there's been some remodeling, uh, and we can also see that the pit structure to the south has gone through several changes. Um, currently, it doesn't really have a bench, and there's masonry all the way from the floor up to the, the roof level. You can see some of that just, uh, ah, just sort of in front of where Steve Copeland, one of our field archaeologists, is pointing uh, in that photo. And um, the difference in masonry style suggests that there's been some changes and some of that masonry was added. Now, this is the kind of evidence we use to reconstruct site histories, architectural change over time. Um, it's that kind of idea of, you know, you, you go into a house that's maybe 150 years old and you really get a sense of, oh, wow, the kitchen used to be this tiny space way over here at the back of the house. And then we knocked out a wall so that the kitchen could be in the living room and we'd have an open floor plan. Those kind of things tell us a heck of a lot about social organization, about where people want certain activities to happen uh, and how they want their space to be organized and what sorts of groups of people might be using those spaces. We're using that same principle to understand what these architectural changes through time mean uh, at the Haney site. Now, in this case, apparently uh, when the structure, the pit structure uh, was no longer inhabited, it was filled in with household debris. But as Carrie's going to describe in a second, that is, this debris is kind of unique. Um, we're not just talking about trash. Now, the radiocarbon dates from some of that debris suggest that the layered midden deposits you can see in the photo on the lower left um, date to the Chaco and era. We've got radiocarbon dates from the 10 hundreds into the early 11 hundreds. And this is awesome because it means we can identify a specifically Chacoan uh, depositional context on the site. Uh, and Carrie's going to talk a little bit more about the artifacts out of there. Thanks, Callum. Yeah, this this is uh, this has been one of the most exciting places at the site for us to look at the artifacts from from this particular trench. Um, and the interesting thing is, uh, we found a very unique artifact type 
um, and I'm showing you a picture of it here, and probably you're, many of you are like, what is that? What these little guys are, are ceramic effigies that look like um, bifurcated burden baskets. And I've put a picture on there of a complete bifurcated burden basket, just so you can have some idea of how we're making this call. And apparently bifurcated uh, basket effigies made of pottery are not uncommon in the Chaco world. Uh, a recent dif dissertation by Ed Jolie actually looked at the, all the occurrences of basketry across the Chaco world. And he uh, may has a list in his dissertation of these bifurcated basket effigies that have been found uh, made of pottery uh, found across the Chaco world and even in Pueblo Benito there's only six of these little pottery effigies that have been identified and we have six in this one trench at um, at the Haney site. So this one location, the midden that is filling in that structure that dates to the Chaco era, has a number of these little bifurcated um, burden basket effigies. Now, I don't know exactly what they're used for, um, but uh, Ed Jolie and Lori Webster discuss their possible use in fertility ritual. And nonetheless, whatever we're seeing with these uh, burden baskets is that there's something special about this deposit and something that's different about this deposit. Another element in this particular um, artifact assemblage from that particular location is that there's a lot of ladles found in in that location more so than anywhere else on the site. So what we're looking at is a is a um, this bar chart is showing you the percentages of different pottery vessel forms, with the first column representing the pottery rim sherds found in this one trench, and the second column showing all the pottery from the overall site. So basically, a third of all the ladles found on the whole site come from this one trench, and about half of the ladle handles come from this particular trench. So what this is telling us is that this is a special location in the community to deposit these special items, or that it represents the refuse from specialized activities associated with food serving or perhaps fertility rituals. So this gives us a view of some of those Chaco practices that Kellum was talking about earlier that may be occurring at the Haney site and that we're seeing documented in just this one location within the Lakeview community so far. Yeah, totally carry those kinds of like special depositions with unique items. I've, I've seen that at, at Chimney Rock and, and other great houses I've worked at as well. Um, so I'm going to scoot over just a couple meters to the east. I mean, this is literally like 10 or 12 feet away, um, area C2, which shows some real similarities, but also some contrast with what we were just looking at. It's another north-south trench um, that's uh, revealing a lot about the history of the site. Our trenches have slowly been working their way back from somewhere up in the 10 hundreds back down into the 8 hundreds as we've been excavating downward. Um, and once again, these trenches pass through a room suite. Uh, with the surface rooms to the north and the pitch structure to the south. It's basically like if you walked out your front door, well, you'd have to walk out your front door and go down a hatch to get into your basement it, it is a way of thinking of that. Now we've identified two sequences of floors in the surface rooms. The upper one, probably the latest, radiocarbon dates and artifacts from this thin little wedge of debris between the two floors um, suggest that the upper one dates from the 10 hundreds while the lower one dates from the 9 hundreds. And the shirt you see in the lower, uh, lower right photo is a shirt resting on the floor of that 9 hundreds era construction. So the process of excavation is actually a lot like going through a renovation in a house where you're peeling back the carpet and discovering, oh, there's wood floors underneath, this is great. Um, in the case of this, uh, this room, there are still cultural deposits below the lower floor that we've exposed. Um, and so, and the walls keep going down. So we think there's gonna be at least a third floor underneath there. So three different phases of remodeling in the structure. Now the pit structures to the south reflect this, this history of change too. We've clipped portions of three superimposed structures with the trenches, that is structures that were used one after the other. Um, you can see two of them pretty clearly in the photo on the left. Um, so first on the scene was a big, what we call an oversized pit structure. It would have been, oh, it was five to six meters across. So that's some, you know, 25 feet across, um, a big pit house. And it probably dates to the mid or late 800s. 
Um, this is really exciting because these are relatively rare structures that seem to indicate social hierarchy. You know, it's, it's kind of a precursor of a great house in a way. It's one house that's way bigger compared to all the other ones in the community. This structure was um, filled in with debris and another pit structure built within the fill, within the pit. And then finally, a small kiva or pit structure has clipped the edge of these two structures. And you can actually see that uh, fairly well as that arcing uh, line of kind of a semicircle of stones uh, in the, the left-hand side of that trench. Radiocarbon dates suggest that that pit structure was being filled in by the late 900s or the early 10 hundreds. So we've got a solid sequence in this room suite that dates from the 800s all the way up into the early to mid 10 hundreds. Basically, it's a house that was continually occupied uh, and remodeled for 200 or more years. Um, we've also got a, a, a trench up against the west wall of the West Great House. And so this is maybe, oh, about 50, 60 feet further east from area C2. The goal of this was to get an idea of what the Great House construction looked like what it was resting on, what kind of techniques the masons used um, to get a clean look at the, at the masonry architecture. But in the process, this trench has uncovered an awesome stratigraphic sequence that's exposed uh, deposits from about AD 1200 all the way back to AD 800. So 400 years of history are exposed in about four to six feet of deposits right here. The uppermost layers are comprised of the collapsed walls of the Great House uh, as it fell over. And those walls are resting on this thin little layer of puddled reddish mud that we think might be the plaster that was on the exterior of the Great House. Um, there's a narrow midden deposit that is probably associated with the Chacoan occupation of, of the building. Um, and below that, there's some evidence that the ground might have been cleared and leveled around the Great House when it was constructed. So we're getting a bit of evidence of the kind of landscape level and architectural practices that people were engaging in. Now, the Great House itself sits on top of this massive three foot deep midden deposit that dates almost entirely to the AD 900s based on radiocarbon dates and, and ceramics. I'm fairly confident that this is gonna to prove to be one of the only stratigraphically excavated midden deposits that dates to the 900s uh, to this time period in the Mesa Verde region. These are fairly rare, um, so a pretty exciting result. That midden uh, actually rests on top of a series of activity surfaces with excavated pits. Uh, we're not entirely sure what those pits were used for. We've taken samples from them and we're gonna be looking at them through the spring and into the summer. Um, you can see some of those pits in the, the photo on the right. Uh, we think those pits date to the 800s. So this area would have been outside of a building uh, in the 800s and people would have been using it for, for various kinds of things. Uh, and basically this whole area was always outside of a building either, um, uh, you know, both in the 800s, the 900s, and during the Chacoan period. Um, I've, ju I've just never seen a stratigraphic profile in the Southwest that seems to have so much history and information exposed in one small area. So this has been really exciting for us. Uh, Carrie's gonna talk a little bit about some of the pottery in that too. Yeah, absolutely. And so those 400 years of history that Kellum can see in that stratigraphy are also mirrored in the pottery that we see in all of those different stratigraphic levels. So pottery is really great because we can date different types of pottery to particular time periods based on their design styles. So for those of you who aren't familiar, archeologists in the Southwest often use what is called the Pecos classification to look at general periods of time with the earliest Pueblo period called the Basket Maker III period starting, in, starting around AD 500 and going through more recent Pueblo I, II, and III periods going up to around AD 1300. So when we're looking at pottery, we can't get to those precise dates that Kellum was talking about, like we were able to get at with radiocarbon dating, but we can get at these general dates that are associated with the Pecos classification. So what I'm showing you in this bar chart, and I'm going to show you a couple of these throughout the presentation, is that this bar chart is showing you the proportions of pottery that date to different time periods by different excavation levels or strata with the top strata on the left side of the chart and the deepest strata on the right. So what you're seeing in this chart is that the top strata contains the most recent pottery types and the lowest strata contains the earliest. So we're showing you this mainly because it's good and it's supporting what Kellum just said 
that this is the pattern that we want to have. It shows us that the strata are not disturbed and that we have sort of the correct sequence of earlier pottery on the bottom and more recent pottery on the top and helps support those interpretations that Kellum is making about the stratigraphic levels um, in this particular unit. Yeah, and it is nice to get the confirmation that this is relatively intact stuff over here as well. We've got some evidence of backhoe operation over here in the 1980s and uh, just being able to say, okay, this is real stuff, that, that's nice. Mm -hmm. So area D uh, we, is a test pit, a two meter by two meter test pit and we call a phone booth because as you can see, it's kind of a shaft that goes straight down. And I promise when we had people in there, there was plywood and shoring and all sorts of safety equipment evolved. Uh, we, 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 we took that off to take the photos. Um, at the base of this unit, uh, we found a pit structure that we think dates to the mid or late 800s. Um, it was incredibly well preserved because the roof had been burned when people moved out of the building. And so our fingers are crossed that some of those burned beams, you can see a couple in the profile of the unit, uh, fingers crossed that those are going to produce dendrochronological dates and give us a, an even tighter uh, window for when people were here. Now beneath the roof, we found a charred reed or bulrush mat. And I've got a photo of it down in sort of the center uh, on the bottom. And then next to it on the right is an exam a better preserved example uh, to give you an idea of what that looked like. It was a kind of a floor mat that was common in the Basket Maker 3 Pueblo 1 period. Um, only a handful of, it was incredibly well preserved because it had burned like that. And when we peeled back that mat, underneath it we found what's called a complex sipapu. Um, it's, a it's a rare ritual feature type that's uh, really uncommon. There's only a handful have been excavated in the Mesa Verde region in southwest Colorado, and I don't think there's any known from places outside of uh, southwest Colorado. Now, it suggests that the inhabitants of this particular pit structure probably had an important ritual role within the community. Um, we have, I, I struggled to come up with a good analogy for what uh, what, what this would be like having this kind of feature in your house. The closest I could come up with is that uh, some, some houses have like a family altar or a family chapel in them. Um, and you can probably imagine how there are specific rules for how you use that chapel or altar. Uh, the, the people who are associated with it are a specific group in the family. Um, who's allowed near it, how they move around it. There's all these rules involved. And I think we can imagine that that was similar uh, for this pitch structure. Um, it does give us a little bit more of an indication about the kinds of social stratification that may have existed here during the 800s. Uh, and that this pit house and the inhabitants in it were not necessarily the same as everybody else in the community. Um, so there's also some interesting observations about the ceramics uh, that were deposited uh, after this structure was no longer in use. And Carrie's gonna talk to you about that. Absolutely, well, most of the pottery that we're seeing in this particular unit also date to that time period that Callum was talking about or the mid 800s um, and so what we're seeing here is that similar pattern to what we saw in the last bar chart where the upper levels which are shown on the left have the more recent pottery and the lower levels that are shown on the right have the earlier pottery. So again, this is showing that we have good control, good stratigraphic control, and that this particular unit was not disturbed. And that was really important as what Kellum was talking about earlier for the Haney site, because many areas do have disturbance. Yeah, and another thing that's kind of cool about this, and I'll just pop back to this other slide for a second, um, Unlike that area west of the West Great House where I was getting all excited because like, oh, 400 years of history and six feet. Here, it seems like a lot of these deposits, which as you can see are relatively complex and stratified, the ceramics suggest that these deposits were actually put in there in relatively rapid fashion. So we might mm -hmm. be looking at something more like, here's 40 years in six feet, not 400 years in four feet. Um, right. So really different kinds of practices involved in what happened after these pit structures uh, were, were used. Uh, so here's a composite map of all the structures that we have identified on the Haney site so far. As you can see, a lot of these structures are kind of related to one another. You know, the wall segments uh, might, they're, they're kind of pointing to one another and that the units that we've been working on, there seems to be relationships between them. 
Um, it was actually really exciting uh, when we realized that all the trenches we had opened up and we're excavating in, we're probably working in the same building. I remember I had the interns go out and I said like, stand on that wall and stretch your arms out in the orientation of the wall. And everybody ended up kind of pointing at each other and went, holy smokes, we're working in one large building. We thought <laughs> that they were going to be discrete little unit pueblos, but in fact, it seems to be one big thing with, you know, 25 or 30 rooms uh, when it's all said and done. Um, so there's apparently a large arcing building that's sort of stretching out from beneath and to the northwest of, of the Great House. Another interesting thing is we were completely caught off guard by the quantity of pre-Chacoan remains at Haney. Uh, the developing consensus is that this was a major dense village be that began in the, uh, the, sometime in the AD 800s, and it continued to be lived in into the 900s, into the 1000s, right up until the construction of the Chacoan Great House. And so a lot of these structures we're looking at are, were inhabited for really long periods of time, like 250, 250, maybe 300 years in a couple of cases. Um, this is a welcome surprise, and here's why. I think the Haney site might be one of the few places in the Northern Southwest where we can examine a full sequence from the 800s all the way up to the 1200s. Um, Chaco Canyon might be one of the few other places I can think of where sites have that deep kind of stratification in history. We've got the pre-Chacoan, the Chacoan, and the post-Chacoan all stacked up on top of each other here. And I think I can count on one hand the, the number of sites in the region with this combination of structures, features, uh, and periods of inhabitation. What it allows us to do is we can see how a community changed through a huge span of time, uh, through some phenomenal social and environmental changes, and we can do it with an incredible level of detail. One of the biggest surprises so far uh, is that ancestral Pueblo people were living at Haney in the AD 900s. Now, the population of southwestern Colorado grew steadily from AD 500 up until about 890. Um, and then there was some kind of political crisis of leadership, uh, and nearly every village in the region was abandoned, and the population just tanked. Um, population declined by about two thirds. And so for a long time, we'd sort of talked about this as a regional abandonment or some, some, you know, there weren't that many people here, had no good way to characterize it. Well, obviously some people stayed behind. It wasn't completely abandoned. Uh, we don't know much about these folks. We don't know much about how they organized their communities, but the work at Haney is going to change that. I think this must've been one of the bigger population centers throughout the 900s. Uh, so we'll be able to understand a little bit more about how people organized. And it looks like they continued to live in the same houses that they'd had since the 800s with some changes, some remodels, some reorganization of the use of space. Uh, we don't seem to have these big oversized pit structures anymore. It's not clear if we've got complex CPAPU. Stratification may have actually declined during the 900s and 1000s. Um, so it's gonna be really interesting to get a much better characterization of what was Haney like before the Chaco and stuff was constructed. Um, and that'll allow us to say, well, what kind of changes came into the community? How would that have been experienced by people living there in the 10 hundreds? Um, and it's gonna be a lot of fun linking our developing story for Haney to the wider Lakeview community and to the wider world around Haney. And in fact, it's, it's Carrie and the lab folks who've been doing most of this work right now. They've been working with a lot of the collections uh, from Ida Jean and Wallace. Uh, and that allows us to begin to position the work we're doing with our excavation data into this wider Lakeview community. So I'm gonna turn it over to Carrie for a little bit now. Absolutely, Kellen, thank you. Yeah, and what we're able to do with the artifact data is a little different than what um, Kellen can do with architectural data. We're able to get at sort of the overall site, and that tells us uh, sort of the overall picture of communities of practice and trade relationships that we see for the overall site. Um, and of course, we'll be able to tie some of these artifactual sets of data back into those different um, architectural locations the site. But for right now, we're just going to take a big overview of, of the pottery data that we're seeing from especially Haney and Ida Jean that we've done so far to date. So with all of the elements that Kellum just talked about, we now know that most of the area of the site that we've excavated from Haney take dates to sort of around the AD 800s. Well, most of our pottery comes from the Pueblo I period, so that fits very well with that time period. We do see Pueblo II pottery and Pueblo III pottery, and even a little bit of the earliest, the Basket Maker III pottery, but most of the materials we see are come dating to that Pueblo I period. So that fits really well with what we're seeing architecturally um, out at the site, uh, on the part of the site that we've excavated so far.
Now, one of the things that's really interesting to get at those questions of trade and social practices that folks were participating in, how close are they to Chaco in the types of non-local materials that we have at Haney? And we don't have a lot, but what we do have are non-local pottery, especially that are coming in from all over. We have Chaco black on white shirts. We have Chusca pottery coming in from the Chusca Mountains on the border of New Mexico and Arizona. We have Cayenta pottery coming in from Northern Arizona. We even have a couple of examples of muggy owned smudged wares that are coming from sort of central New Mexico, as well as white mountain red wares coming from the area around the Zuni, um, Zuni New Mexico. So we have a lot of uh, a lot of interesting evidence of pottery trade, even if it's in pretty small amounts so far at Haney. The same is true with our chipstone data and the stone tools that we see being used by people at Haney. Most of it's local. Most of our materials are locally available, but we have non-local materials coming in from that same broad suite of areas across the Chaco world, from Zuni Spotted Church to a number of sources that come from Southeast Utah to Narbona Pass shirt that comes from the Chuska Mountains and obsidian that we've sourced to Mount Taylor and the Jemez Mountain sources in New Mexico. In addition to these lines of evidence of pottery and chipstone, we have some really exotic ornaments that we're seeing um, at the Haney site. And those include jet pendants, turquoise pendants, uh, a lot of shell jewelry. There's an example here of a shell pendant made from a broken glycimerous um, bracelet as well as a really unique Hohokam shell pendant. Now, I'm calling this a Hohokam shell pendant because the style of bird looks more like the style of birds that we see in the Hohokam archeological cultural area, which is centered around the Tucson and Phoenix Basin. And so this is a, this is a pretty lo long distance trade item that's coming up into the Haney site. In addition to ornaments from Haney, we have a number of exotic ornaments that we're seeing in our preliminary analysis of ornaments from Wallace, from, um, from jet, uh, the cute little jet bird pendant here, turquoise, um, non-local pottery that have been made into pendants, um, abalone shell, and we have our postdoc, Michelle Turner, who's taking a lead on a lot of the work on the Wallace artifact analysis, looking at some of the ornaments from the Wallace site here. The next one, okay. And then finally, we have evidence of the pottery that we're seeing at the Haney site and how that compares to the pottery we've analyzed from Ida Jean. From the whole project, we've analyzed about uh, almost 60,000 pottery sherds so far. And Haney has that earlier component based on most, most of the pottery seems to date to the Pueblo I period. Whereas Ida Jean has a much later pottery assemblage where most of the pottery we seem to have dates to the Pueblo III period. Now, it's really important to think about this as making sure that it's not biased by our sampling. So far, we've only excavated on the west side of Haney, so we're definitely seeing the earlier occupation at Haney. We may for sure see some of these later periods coming in and being more prevalent in the pottery assemblages through time. And then Ida Jean, which we have a collection that was um, available at the Heritage Center, but it's not necessarily a, a sample of everything that was available at the site. It's just focused on some of the later excavations that, that they did at, at the Ida Jean site. So all of these things are letting us get at some of those big picture questions of how the community changed over time, what sort of interactions people were having and trade relationships that people were having across the community and from the community and beyond. So one last thing that's just my personal interest that I, I have to talk about um, is that we have this really interesting artifact uh, type that we're seeing at Haney um, and, and at Ida Jean, um, and I think there'll be some at Wallace, although we're just getting into the pottery analysis at Wallace, is that we have some pottery that have glaze paint on them. Now, this is a little bit unusual because most of these pottery designs tend to, that we're seeing this glaze paint on, tend to look like Pueblo II time period designs. 
Now, Pueblo II designs, Pueblo II pottery in the Mesa Verde area tend to be painted with a matte mineral paint, not a glaze paint. There really shouldn't be any pottery types in the central Mesa Verde region that have glaze paint that date to the Pueblo II period. So as we keep finding these shirts, and I think we've got about uh, 45 to 50 of them so far from Haney, we're really intrigued. Is this an accident or are potters at the Haney site trying out a different technology? Is this some sort of different, uh, you know, production group that we see going on at, at the Haney site? Um, and and I'm, I'm hoping to continue investigating this because it's pretty fascinating to me. Hopefully we'll do some compositional studies to see how and what materials they're using to make this glaze paint on this small proportion of the assemblage. Now that glaze stuff is super cool. I was really excited when you started pointing those out to me because uh, it just gives a good sense of continuity through parts of the community uh, through time. Yeah. So I'm going to start wrapping up here a little bit and circle back to some of those big research questions that we, we were addressing with this project. Um, we haven't really dug into the human and environmental relationships too much yet. Um, at, but at the very least, I can say that it seems like folks at Haney weathered a significant climatic downturn in the early uh, 900s, where we say we've got this continuity through here, and this does seem to be one of the places that people continue to, to live. Um, and we're in the midst of getting a much better handle on the uh, immediate effective environment that surrounds Haney. It seems to be at this choke point for water. We've noticed that a lot of the drainages from the surrounding area all kind of funnel down and, and go into one single channel right by the site. And it seems like a lot of water might have been available for different kinds of farming practices. So as we move forward, uh, we're, we're setting up some new hypotheses to test about you know, how were people using that water? How are they using uh, the, the agricultural land that surrounds the site? In terms of social stratification, I'm excited that we've now identified these Chacoan deposits at the west side of the site. We can really start the comparisons between, all right, here's the Chacoan stuff, here's the things from small houses in the community, here's the pre chaco and the post chaco and begin to get a look at what was that relationship like uh, during the Chacoan era between folks at Haney and, and, and people living in Chaco Canyon. Uh, the 800s villages, uh, the 800s village component was a complete surprise and really unexpected. Um, the presence of an oversized pit structure, the presence of that complex sipapu, uh, it suggests that this was a socially stratified village. And so the question is, you know, what did this place look like as it moved out of this stratified village? Oh, nice cat, Carrie. <laughs> we knew it was just a matter of time. Um, so one of the questions I've got is, you know, how did this community transition from this very stratified uh, ninth century village? Um, did it change? To, it seems like it became less stratified during the 900s. We don't have evidence yet of an oversized pit structure. We don't have a lot of evidence of these, um, you know, different kinds of features that set structures apart. But then by the Chacoan period, of course, we've got a great house there and we've got small houses in the surrounding community. So it's almost like it's cycling through time. I really want to know more about that, that 900s component uh, and early 1000s component. In terms of community centers, we can see that the site was clearly important uh, from as far back as the 800s. This was a big place, a central place for a lot of people for a long period of time. So was the fact that this was one of those big aggregated stratified villages in the 800s, one of the reasons that the spot was chosen for a Chaco era great house oh, some 200 and some years later? Um, we also want to look at the relationships between Haney and other sites. Haney sure seems to have more early stuff than Ida Jean and Wallace, um, but there are definitely hints from architectural styles and some tree ring dates that Wallace, uh, the great house at least, might actually be a little bit earlier than some of the construction in Haney. So we're zeroing in on that as we get a much better sense of the site. Um, in terms of identity formation, Compared to Ida Jean, uh, both the Haney Great Houses seem a little sloppy in their, their masonry construction. And that's one of those clues that archaeologists look at when we're saying, well, was it actually, you know, trained Chaco and Masons who were part of this project? Or was it local people uh, interpreting a Chaco and pattern in their own vernacular? Well, the fact that you've got both within the same community, this just raises the complexity of this question quite a bit. Uh, it's, it's exciting as we, we, we delve into that one. In addition, the uh, evidence from the depositional practices, if you remember way back into that, that westernmost trench where we had all the, the ladle handles and the basket effigy, a little figurine um, ceramic effigies, 
we're getting some real insight into the way that uh, Chacoan folks in this community, or at least people living in this community, were choosing to express themselves within a Chacoan world. Um, I'm also excited about that, the low visibility trait of that, um, of the, the glaze paint where it does so, show some continuity through time from the 800s on up. Um, so we're beginning to get a sense of just how complex things were in this community uh, as people who probably had long roots in the area uh, interpreted what Chaco was to them and how uh, potentially you know, Chaco and people moving in uh, interacted with those folks. So as we're moving forward, um, we've got a couple directions we want to go, and I'll share some of those with you here as we've, uh, we've begun to formulate our, our, our plan for, well, hopefully for this season. We'll see what happens. Um, we suspect that there is a big room block lurking um, uh, to the west of the Great House, an early, uh, an 800s era structure. And we really want to test and see if this is a, a, a tightly arc-shaped building. That's a specific kind of architectural construction known from that period. And we want to confirm, does this thing have a U-shaped structure like some better known uh, sites in the area like McPhee Pueblo, uh, Pueblo de las Colandrinas, places that we know are socially stratified. So we're going to probably place some units to test that hypothesis. Our archival work through the winter has revealed a few places to look for more evidence of the foundations of the West Great House. And so we're hoping that with a couple of test pits, we can begin to refine our map of what that West Great House looked like and hopefully gain a better understanding of the sequence of, of uh, occupation within that building. And most of that's coming from archival work, um, which actually a lot of us have been working on now as we're, we're working from home. Now that we have a handle on the sequence at the site and we can say, all right, we've got stuff from the 800s up to the 1200s. We have kind of an understanding of how the history of the site changed through time. Um, we know a bit about its history. Now we can begin to make focused comparisons with, uh, with our artifact analysis and really begin to say, here's the Chaco and stuff. Here's the, the, the pre Chaco and stuff. Here's the great house uh, context. Here's the non-great house contexts. Um, so as we move forward, uh, we're really looking to begin honing our, our, our targeting of those specific contexts in, 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 uh, in the seasons to come. So I'm going to turn this over to Carrie for a few final remarks, uh, and then we're going to get to all those questions that I've seen coming in uh, as, as we've been talking. Absolutely. Great, Kellum. Thank you so much. Well, no talk uh, would be complete without giving a good acknowledgement to all of the wonderful people, one, all of you that are listening to us, um, all of our donors, all of our program participants and volunteers that make this work possible. We also want to say a thank you to the Earthwatch Institute and History Colorado State Historical Fund that has helped fund this research, as well as giving you an opportunity to see um, Callum, can I? Okay. To, to see any additional resources that we have on our website, at, if you go to our website at crowcanyon.org, there's access for a lot of other materials, such as teacher and student resources, ebooks. There's a really cool new one on our um, Pueblo farming project that has, has been, that's been added recently, site reports, and on our research database that you can search. And if you like this webinar and would like to support more of our distance learning resources, you can make donations um, on our website um, or by calling 1-800-422-8975, extension 452. Be on the lookout also for a survey on this webinar so you can provide us with feedback on your experience. And if you missed any part of the event or want to share it with a friend, we're going to have this posted on our YouTube page as well as on our website. Thank you all so much. And now we're going to go to Sarah, who's going to start asking us some questions, I hope. Looks like there's a number of them have come in as we've been talking. Yes, welcome to Zoomtopia, everybody. Thank you so much for all of the wonderful questions that have come in. Um, Carrie and Kellen, let's start a little bit with uh, the landscape of the Haney site and the Lake community, the Lakeview community, uh, in terms of what might be the physical attraction to the location of that site and do you see any evidence for irrigation and what kind of crops might have been grown in that area? Dude, who asked that question? That's a good question. I, I, I we, so I just pulled up the slide that has the, the best overview of, of the community. You can see that there's this channel kind of snaking down through there uh, that goes just to the west of the Haney site, east of Ida Jean and passes kind of along Wallace. We've begun to suspect that that's not the original location of that channel. 
um, and that it once might have flowed a little bit closer to the Haney site. Um, in terms of the, 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 the greater landscape there, that's the choke point I was talking about, where all that water seems to funnel down into one place. And so as we move forward, we're hopefully going to be doing some agricultural modeling where we can look, we can use uh, GIS to look at the surrounding landscape, get an idea of, okay, it rains one inch in an hour or something, how much water is going to be available passing through that channel. Uh, and then we can do some fancy math and say, well, if you did have little irrigation ditches pushing out of there, how much of the surrounding terrain could you, uh, in fact, irrigate? Personally, I think that this is one of the key things for why Haney and, and the Lakeview community is where it is. You know, folks mapped onto that in the 800s. Um, but there's, you know, now it's become a hypothesis that we can go out and test. And, and that's one of the goals that we have uh, in, in the coming seasons. Good question. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you, Kellum. And uh, have you been able to figure out what the population might have been at the Haney site or perhaps the other, uh, the other nearby outliers? Oh, that's, um, as I said, usually we can get pretty good estimates on that by looking at the surface architecture and going, all right, we can measure how long this room block is. We know that there are cross-cultural patterns and how much space people take up. Uh, and, and uh, or how many pit structures there might be in front of it and how many households there might be. As I said at Haney, all bets are off because so much of it's been covered up, moved around. Uh, when we excavate a unit, it usually is not what we were anticipating to find at all. I can, um, well, I'm always pretty content throwing out ballpark stuff. That's just the way I am. I suspect that the early village in the 800s could have had 250, 300 people um, potentially. I suspect that the population declined moving into the 900s and the 10 hundreds, but that by the time we get into the Chacoan period, there could have been that many people here again. It's also a question of uh, our estimates often are off. Like we know that people living in McMansions, you might have two or three folks in a 5,000 square foot house. Whereas if you look in New York City, you might have six people in an apartment with 900 square feet. So we've got the same problem when we're trying to do population estimates of great houses versus small houses. Um, so I'm kind of dodging it right there, but <laughs> we're working on it. Excellent. Thank you. And then we had quite a bit of interest in the bifurcated basket effigies, Carrie. And can you tell us if those were made locally or coming from somewhere else? And also, has any residual testing been done on any of the ceramics coming out of the Haney site? Like for residue testing, you mean? Is that what? Yes. Resi okay. Well, so what we we haven't um, done any test residue testing on anything from the Haney site as of yet. We hope to do that in the future. Now, I don't know how successful residue analysis would be on these um, little effigies because they're they're um, they're really small. You know, we're only some of like the biggest one is probably. Um, uh, you know, five, maybe five or four or five centimeters in height. So they're actually pretty tiny. Um, and so I, they, they probably didn't actually have much that was in them that was being used in them. But the cool thing about them is that they seem like they might have often been attached to the end of ladle handles. So you see in the center of the screen here, the one and maybe Kellum, I don't know if Kellum can you move them mouse on that one that is attached to, so it's a little one of these bifurcated baskets attached to the end of a ladle handle. So not only is that cool because um, we've got these bifurcated baskets, but it's connected to that larger number of ladles that we were seeing in this particular location. So whatever the connection is, perhaps there's a ritual activity or some sort of ceremony that's done with, you know, serving food. And so it would be interesting to do a residue study on the ladles themselves, as opposed to necessarily the little effigies, because I'm not sure that there would be much um, that they were that that were that was held in them because they were so tiny. Great, thank you, Carrie. And can you tell us what the oldest artifact is that you found at Haney? Oh. oh gosh, I should have looked this up before. Um, we do have, um, and Kellen, maybe you remember, we have some projectile points that uh, date to the Archaic period, don't we, Kellen? Definitely. We've seen some um, of the. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, I, I distinctly remember a biface coming out this summer uh, when we were working with with some folks um, that appears to be an archaic period uh, projectile point or knife. Um, that's not unusual, and I wouldn't take it to mean that like, oh, we're going to get down there and discover that right. there's some massive archaic no. component. Uh, people have always been finding those kinds of things, and for Pueblo folks, those um, those projectile points have a variety of different meanings. They get recycled into new contexts and new uses, um, so uh, it might not necessarily mean that there's an archaic component at the site, but people were certainly bringing those objects there and having them do specific kinds of work uh, within their within their houses, within their households, within their community. And that's really common throughout the th throughout uh, you know most of the sites in this area that we'll find projectile points that were probably collected just like we like to collect things on the landscape, right? And even if you know we we shouldn't be picking them up, they pick them up as well, right? So it's that same concept of of, of people being attached to those items and bringing them back to the community. Some of the earliest artifacts that we think probably represent actual occupation is that we do have quite a bit of basket maker three so basket maker three period pottery and so i hope that we might underneath some of this pueblo one period uh, of uh, architecture that kellen's been talking about that maybe we'll find um, a basket maker three period and even earlier pit house that wouldn't surprise me there's a known basket maker three community just a hop skip and a jump uh, mm -hmm. east of us so it's just a matter of time it's just there's a lot of stuff covering everything up yeah Wonderful. And what has been the biggest surprise at the Haney site to date? <laughs> oh, that's a hmm, biggest surprise. <sighs> well, huh. I, as I said, we've certainly been caught off guard by how much early stuff there is. But uh, personally, the one that has maybe, maybe it's not so much a surprise, but that's been like a continually evolving set of ideas that guide how we go about excavating and then we find something we're like well we gotta kind of rethink what that is and try a different strategy one of the units that i did not talk about that is um uh, i wonder if i can get back to the site map here in area a we have been going down through layers and layers and layers of, of relatively unstratified deposits that seem to be recently deposited and we got down and we saw a circular outline of a couple of stones, a little bit of different colored dirt. And we thought, okay, I guess we're finally getting to, I, I thought at first it was a Pueblo One surface room. And I went, yeah, it's this kind of somewhat rectangular building. I bet we're going to get down in there and the floor is going to be like that floor far below the surface and there's just nothing left. So I think I set Steve Copeland or somebody and said, why don't we put a little test window in there and see what's down there. I come back about three hours later and the guy's like leaning over and he's got his arm all the way down. The wall went down like 40, 50, 60 centimeters or something like that completely. Like we went, well, that's not a Pueblo One surface room by any uh, stretch of the imagination. Our current thought is that it is a, um, it's probably a kiva or a pit structure that dates from the 900s. So the architectural style is not what we're used to seeing. We just, I mean, we haven't, not very many of those have been excavated so we're not really sure what it should look like um, on one side it's got this deep wall the other side seems to be cut into the native uh, natural, natural sediment uh, so it's almost like they're terracing this structure uh, on a hill slope i don't know we'll find out this this next season hopefully <laughs> well and those and that, that's oh well, I was just going to ask if you've had anything that's caught you off. Yeah, well, I was just going to say that it also depends on your perspective because I, you know, I'm obviously going to think that there's some, you know, I think the, the glaze painted pottery is really, was a little unexpected because um, I'm a pottery person. So I love the Pueblo pottery and I've been studying it from all across the Southwest. And so seeing those glaze paints is really sort of unique because we have their Pueblo glaze painted pottery, but none that date to that particular time period. So when we started to see those and I was like what what is this what is this telling us is this a continuation of, of some of the glaze paint that's earlier you know are they just experimenting is it just an accident so for me that was really exciting so it, it, it also depends on what what part of the project you're working on yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> excellent thank you and um, let's uh, talk a little bit about the non-local ceramics that you've been finding at the Haney site do you find that those artifacts are, are coming from a certain time period or do you see it all across the board in every time period? 
Well, um, Callum, can you go back to that slide uh, of the Haney site uh, that has the, 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 the pie chart? Um, you know, there's not a lot of it. Um, I would say that we see different types of non-local pottery in different time periods. So for example, in the Pueblo one time period, we're seeing a little bit more of the redware pottery that comes in from Southeast Utah. And in, you know, in, in the Pueblo two period, we're seeing more of the Chaco and Chuska um, pottery, right? So, um, but, but again, we're not seeing a lot of it thus far at Haney, but I think that maybe that because we're gonna, hopefully as we get into closer to the Great House and in units that are more associated with the Great House, we'll see more non-local pottery. Right now, since we're looking at that earlier Pueblo One component, we're just not seeing quite as much. I think we'll see more as we as we move um, to other areas of the site. And I'll be curious to see just where it is concentrated, as you said. You know, it'd be one thing right. if it's scattered evenly across the entire site at small right. houses at the Great House, but if it all happens to be concentrated in these few contexts we've identified as being Great House right. associated, that really tells us something. Absolutely, and we haven't evaluated that yet, so I can't. I sort of can't tell you that right now. Great, thank you. And maybe if you can uh, tell us a little bit more about the agricultural history in, in the Lakeview Group community and perhaps how successful it's been over time. Are you able to, are there indicators where you're able to see how the, the soils um, and the nutrients in the soils have changed through time? Those things are all possible. Um, we've got a few test units in that have, most of the places that we've placed them for that kind of geochemical work have been right within the site itself. So probably not the kinds of places that people were growing food in the past. Um, I am going to, there, I guess what comes to mind is, I can't directly answer that question right now, but I can tell you exactly what I want to look at to get at that question. And that is the difference between these valley bottom soils that you can see on your screen here. That's basically everywhere that there's not little trees, all the sort of southern and lower portion of that photo. What are the different potentials of that valley bottom soil versus the more hilltop and mesa top soil. You can't see it in this photo, but if you go just oh, a mile, two miles east of here, you're up on kind of classic Mesa Verde Lus, mesa top soils. And there's a whole community of sites that are contemporaneous with Haney over there. I really wanna know, are there different affordances for those environmental conditions? And did that affect the potential successes of these two communities? Does one of them last longer than the other? Does one of them manage to weather different kinds of environmental change in different ways? Um, that would be a contrast I'd like to see. Excellent, thank you. I, I guess I could follow that one up by just pointing out that like, as you can see, people are still farming there. I mean, they're growing hay and previously they were, there were orchards um, that covered most of the area east of the Haney site and north of the Haney site between about 1905 and 1940, uh, even into the 60s, I think. Um, so uh, it, it, it has been a place that people in the last 150 years have continued to derive subsistence from. Wonderful. Thank you. And we do have so many questions. I know that we can't get to all of them today, but let's wrap it up with maybe one of your favorite discoveries at the Haney site and what you might most be excited about. Carrie, I'll, I'll let you go first. I'm going to think on this one a bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, well, I won't just say the glaze wears again. Um, uh, I, I mean, I think the uh, you know for for the the things that we've seen at the Haney site have been pretty uh, impressive overall. It's amazing that we're seeing this continuity of um, occupation um, and people living there for such a long period of time. And for me as a, as a person who really studies the pottery and loves the pottery, it's fascinating because the pottery is not fitting 
the standard types as well as it should because we're seeing such continuity that we're seeing where the, the styles are transitioning one into another and it makes it really difficult to do my job because it's harder to separate out the types at a site like this where people were living there relatively continuously for you know four or five hundred years. So that's been kind of exciting for me as I'm looking at the pottery uh, from, from Haney, is seeing that really interesting sort of community of practice and how that changes over time. And I think I'm going to follow that up with that, that some of those periods where things are blending uh, and, and, and in transition, it, it, I feel very privileged that the, the, the Archaeological Conservancy is letting us uh, conduct work here because I don't think I will ever anywhere else get a chance to see this moment in time in the early 900s into the middle 900s uh, in this region. Uh, it's when communities are in transition, when the pottery is in transition, and we've got places where it's like I can show you a floor and go, look, this is probably the first corrugated vessel that anybody in the region was making. I mean, it's there with all these earlier ceramics, and there's this one corrugated shirt amongst that perfect little assemblage. That has really been blowing my mind um, in a way that uh, I, I thought I kind of knew what I I had a nice little narrative about the 900s and I told it for a long time. And now when people ask me, I'm like, I don't know, you'll have to get back to me in a year or two because we're going to write the book on it yeah. um, at yeah. this place. So that I think that, and thank you for bringing that up, uh, Kellum, that we also, in my thank yous, I forgot to thank the Archaeological Conservancy. We want to say we're so privileged to be able to be working at such an, a fascinating archaeological site, and we appreciate the opportunity that the Archaeological Conservancy is allowing us to work there. Yes. Well, Carrie and Kellum, thank you both so much for sharing your knowledge and expertise and and your passion for the research and the work that you're doing at Crow Canyon and with all of our wonderful, wonderful, wonderful partners that we've been collaborating with. Our Crow Canyon community is phenomenal and I wanna thank all of the viewers for tuning in and please do stay tuned for more upcoming events such as this. Yeah, thanks to that 172 thank people who stuck it out to the end as well. Wow, that's, that's, that's great. Impressive. <laughs> and we'll try to work on answering folks some questions uh, over the next week or so. Looks like there's a lot still to go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. Well, thanks. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Hope it's a good happy hour. <laughs>